I'm going to talk to you about a few different things, but uh, to add to your last comment uh, is that attention being paid to the spine is my dad. My dad was an old country neurosurgeon, as he put it, and he said that when someone asked him, said Dr. Johnson said, you do spine surgery, he said, he said, yes, ma'am, it's the backbone of the industry. <laughs> so that's actually my dad right here. He's passed away about a decade ago in his late 80s. <clears throat> quite a guy, quite a guy. And uh, he gave me a lot of inspiration. Actually, I thought of wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon, then I went round and round and eventually became a neurosurgeon, but I think I'm still part orthopedic surgeon with my colleagues, and that's why I get along with them all so well. Probably better than my neurosurgical colleagues, but uh, don't tell them that. Anyway, I'm gonna talk about, and I love this title actually, and Rod just came up with this title, Technology Integration in the Operating Room. And I go, wow, you know what? That's what I'm actually all about. That's one of my new big, big things, <clears throat> is how to get this stuff to work in the operating room in, in very short answer to that. And I'm gonna make a little trip through kind of where we, where we were a little bit, not too much to dwell on the past, but it, it is interesting to see where we were, um, where we are. We do such incredible things, and then you just heard some lectures uh, this morning. Um, Nick Theodore is talking about robotics, which I can put this into past, present, and future, or three generations, okay? And the generations, uh, I'll elucidate as to how I've grouped them. So I'm talking about this technology integration, and there's a little history about image guidance and spine surgery, is that back in the 90s, somebody gave me a computer that was from radionics, and they said, oh, well, we do this brain navigation. And I had a laboratory, and I was just a young faculty guy <clears throat> in the early 90s at UCLA, and I said, let's make this thing work in the spine. So we started putting in thoracic pedicle screws back in the mid-90s and published paper, and these are a couple little things of, of where this history goes back. And we started taking this thing that I called an expensive pointer and we turned it into actually a usable instrument where we could do calibration of surgical instruments and we could point inside and do work with real instruments. And that's what this was all about. So we used to do CT scans. We had to take the patient to the CT scanner. We had to put the data on a little, a little card or, or a, and then it, it turned into a CD and some different things like that. And that's how we actually transferred the data. We put it in the computer and then we got this 3D image on the computer and we'd have to do matching and all this stuff. Oh my God, it was impossible. So anyway, there were some papers that motivated me is that Chris Paramore at Barrow Neurologic Institute published a paper and said that uh, the vertebral artery made it unsuitable in 20% of patients to put transarticular screws in. And I said, you know what, let's, let's, go to the, let's go to the laboratory and let's figure out whether there, there's any validity in this or maybe there's a different way around it. I think Chris was right because if you look at this image here that's in the lower left or lower right, he's, he's correct. So anyway, we went and studied this and we looked at frameless stereotaxy. We did this in the laboratory then we go to the operating room and we had some brave patients that let us do this stuff on them. And so we started doing this back in the late 90s and we published this in 2001 is that we figured it was about 5% of patients that you actually cannot. So if you can do custom trajectories and you can do these things, then you can do safe operations because there were people dying from transarticular screws. Okay, when all you had was fluoroscopy. And I said, let's, let's apply this new computer technology. It's pretty neat stuff. So this is where we went to, the, went to the laboratory, and this is what we did. We did it on sawbones first, then we did it in cadavers, then we took them to the operating room. So we got that down to about 5%, and we published that paper. So that kind of led us to a couple other things. So we started doing C1-2 screws and doing them in different ways, and we started putting pedicle screws in, and, and uh, I have to give give credit to Professor Jurgen Harms, who I met, and we were kind of thinking about the same things, and we kind of had a race to the finish line about publication. He published his paper the month before we published ours in the Journal of Neurosurgery, so it's called the Harms, the Harms Fusion Procedure, but we at our shop call it the Stokes Procedure. So, so anyway, um, he's an incredible surgeon, incredible guy. Uh, his bravado is only exceeded by his, ta his incredible skillful talents. He's quite a man, and Jens, I'm sure you know him well. So these are some of the things that we did with that paper, and we even started doing little things. We wrote a paper about how to do an arthrodesis in the facet joint of C12. So we moved on to some other things and said, well, we're using this old generation one technology where we were doing registration, and we learned how to do registration off the front of the spine from 
we do osteophytes and we would do rib heads and things like that. And we were doing thoracoscopic surgery that Nick was talking about earlier, about the same time the guys at Barrow were. <laughs> and so I said, let's see if we can make this work with image guidance. So we did. We set it up in the operating room. We would go there, we'd plan ports, do the registration, then it's a virtual registration. We'd put the ports in, we'd regist register the spine, we'd navigate it, and then we'd do an operation. So it was all virtual. And so here's what it looked like. Okay, this is back in 2000, I think, around 2000, we were doing some of this. So it was kind of neat stuff. It was kind of pushing the technology. This is an integration, okay? That's what I, I, I love this topic when I was given this topic. I said, this is integrating technologies. This is a paper that I wrote back in, what the heck was it? 2005, it was published. So how cool was this? We were doing, this paper was 2005, we published this, and it's merging these two technologies. And that's, this is what I love about what's happening today. Okay, because this, well, okay, this is, this is current though. Okay, I went from generation one where we were doing CT scans before, and there are some things that changed. Okay, we're taking tumors out. Okay, here's big tumors. I got a video, I'm gonna skip that in the, in the interest of time here. But here's what changed. Okay, intraoperative CT scanning in 2006, the creation of um, and image, gui image guidance navigation, which was automatically registering. So that changed everything, okay? All the technology that we're talking about today, and I'm gonna show you some gee whiz cases, but this all changed, okay? Truly disruptive technology, automatic registration. So all these people, okay, that came to listen to me talk about image guidance, they went home, nobody could do it. Okay, it was one of those things, and it's true. If every surgeon can't do this stuff, or at least make it work in some way that's applicable to part of their practice, it's gonna die. So what happened with the intraoperative CT scanner, and there's different ones now, you know, that the, these things, they're just incredible. I mean, now there's some fixed mount ones, then there's portable, and this all actually came from some of the ISO C technology that Siemens had made earlier. It didn't work very well, but this one, and so there's gonna be more. This is gonna get miniaturized. That's what's gonna happen with this. That's part of generation three of my talk. So I'll move on here. So what should we navigate? Okay, and actually I was having a discussion outside with Rod, and we use it so much every day uh, there are very few things that we don't use it for. There are things that I will do OPLL cases which I, when I rarely do them and I'm gonna operate on a patient from the front of the spine, I will navigate those because how many times have we ever done an OPLL case that you go back and you missed a big piece of bone? Okay, you use image guidance, you don't miss those things, okay? This has not made me a great surgeon. I think it made me a better surgeon, okay? I'd like to think I'm a great surgeon, but you know, that's, that's yet to be determined. Uh, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. So anyway, what are the expanded applications? This is actually a whole talk that I gave about expanded applications. We can put some type of referencing technology, and I'm gonna talk about that in, in the laboratory a little bit in, in a brief uh, uh, demo later. But we can, we can adapt image guidance to any part of the spinal column, and the skull, and the sacrum, and the pelvis. So we do it all. I've even done decompressions like I talked about. I've done tumor resections. Um, I've even done it for infections. What about accuracy of some of this stuff? Okay, well, accuracy, we've heard about it. What about navigation and workflow? Okay, see what's happening in this little time lapse? It's kind of, is it playing? What's going on? Okay. So that's what it looks like. Well, I don't know, my video keeps quitting on me here. That's a new one. <laughs> okay, we'll go from here. So what happens when we go to add more technology in the operating room is what this is all about. Not only can we do some great surgery, but there's a whole bunch of things that I'm gonna talk about. But when we use fluoroscopy to do spinal reconstruction surgeries, oh, come on. I'm gonna show this slide later, so, okay. 
I'm just going to move on. And this is going to be the part of the talk where I just show you some of the things that we do that's a little out of the box. Anterior cervical surgery. Here's a patient getting an intraoperative CT scan. Uh, we use a reference frame that's attached to a Mayfield head holder that's uh, it's not custom. It's available commercially. Um, and we will use it for doing anterior cervical surgery. We find that the, um, the Mayfield is actually pretty mobile, that if you actually go up there and shake the patient on the table, you can get several millimeters of motion. Now, several millimeters of motion when you're putting in pedicle screws in C6 and C7, that's bad. So we've got some strategies where we literally just tape the patient down to the table in every way that we can and fixate everything we can. And we do it for different, we do it for almost every body part. And I heard Nick talking about saying, when you get the patient on the table, they're pretty solid. But you know, we look at that and sometimes, you know, a patient rolls around inside of themselves. okay? If they got enough fat on them, they can, okay? So they can move around. So anything we can do to immobilize the patient further is really important. So these are some, this is the reference frame that we use for doing cervical work. Uh, it gives us the ability to put pedicle screws in the, th in the cervical spine and lateral mass screws, so we use it for all those things. I can, put these, I can do all these operations without, without the navigation if, if I had to, but they just, as I said, they make us better surgeons. Uh, what about cervical deformity? These are some decompressions and reconstructions. Here's an unusual case is that uh, it's actually a nurse from another uh, major teaching institution in Los Angeles. Uh, she not only has a clipal file and a severe spinal cord compression, she's got a um, um, cerebellopontine angle, big, huge meningioma, which is asymptomatic. But anyway, she needed an operation. This is actually getting to the heart of my talk, talking about management of technology and integration of systems and making things work. So let me use this time to ask you a question. <laughs> That was on my mind. So this is obviously amazing, and technology is moving forward, and it's cool to have this uh, at our disposal. My question is the following. How much should a, let's just say, average surgeon who's not a master's uh, master-level surgeon like yourself rely on technology? I'll give you an example so that everybody can see that. Subaxial cervical screws, you talked about pedicle screws, C3 to C6. Let's assume you're an average surgeon who's a reasonably safe surgeon. Would it be okay for that surgeon who's not really done pedicle screws C3 through C6 to rely on a navigation device to place such kind of hardware? No. Why not? No. It's there. It's fiduciary intervals one millimeter. That's what the company says. No. The answer is no. I'm not going to tell somebody to work outside of their comfort zone and their box. Um, I, I believe there's some generational things, okay? And I think that if I were out in the community and I'm not doing this in a teaching environment and, and loving it ever since the 1990s, uh, I, I think it's probably not safe for somebody to be doing those kind of things just because they need to stay in their comfort zone. It is within the standard of care. We want to use a legal term about it, it for them to do something that is, uh, is not a high performance case when they can certainly get it done with putting lateral mass screws in the cervical spine. Perfectly acceptable. So why should they put themselves and their patient at risk for doing something that it may be a little bit better? If they got a complicated problem that needs to be fixed in a different way or it has to have it done, then I would urge them to say, and surgeons call me up and they say, why can't I do that? They ask me the same questions. And I say, maybe you better send that to you know, someone who is able to fix this kind of problem. Don't, worry, you know, don't try and go do something that's going to get you in trouble. There are, limit, there are limits. There's definitely limits here. Now, the tech problem has been solved for the moment, at least. So let's, okay. uh, let's hopefully great, not great use question. duct tape. Great question, though. It, it really is, is that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like I always say that Clint Eastwood says a man's got to know his limits. And, you know, I think you know yours. I know mine. There are certain things. I won't put pedicle screws in the mid-cervical spine unless somebody has very amenable anatomy. Okay, so here's a patient with a complicated problem. So we use the image guidance to do the decompression. We use the image guidance to do a reconstruction with the largest pedicle, or it's actually a pedicle screw um, in C2 that uh, I've ever put in the cervical spine of a human being, and it worked. So, you know, these are just some of the applications. What about some of the cervical deformity cases? We actually help teach ourselves how to do these things. Okay, I know how to do this operation, but 
it just augments us in being able to do it. So actually some of this work was being done by John Webb in England before I started got inter getting interested in the late 2000s. And then we published a paper that looked at how to, <clears throat> how to do C7 and T1 osteotomies really to correct cervical thoracic junction deformity, which was based mostly at the cervical thoracic junction. And this is where we use image guidance to do these kind of cases. And so these are the operative technique. I won't go through the anything but the pictures here. And these are the outcomes, what they look like in illustration. And we published this in 2009. But uh, it, it's a very powerful tool. Um, to be able to see and navigate where you are, what you're doing, and give you those that kind of safety. So to answer Yen's question, here we're putting lateral mass screws in the cervical spine all the way up, and we put pedicle screws in. So I don't usually put threat or cervical pedicle screws in anything except C7, occasionally C6. Uh, so these are some of the outcomes of what they look like. And that's what the patient looks like. What about anterior cervical procedures that I talked about? Um, this is a high performance case doing a transoral operation. This is actually a, a Boeing engineer that uh, came to see me and uh, he had a cranial settling problem and I'm not going through too much of this but we simply navigate through the mouth and this is how we do his, his, uh, his uh, malformed odontoid resection. We take it out and we do a posterior fusion on him. Here, here's a, another ultra complex case of a patient who had a, uh, had a uh, had neck cancer, had radiation, had collapse of a vertebra. Uh, CT looked like this with a 3D reconstruction that we did. He needed a transoral operation. Um, and we went, we went through his mouth and we resected uh, this whole lateral mass as well as the old dontoid. We turned him over, we reconstructed him from the backside. And these are some of the steps intraoperative. I got a few videos in here, but just because I've lost so much time, I think I'm gonna keep going. Uh, but these are some of the reconstructions that we did uh, uh, in the end. And these are the posterior, uh, there we go. And so, removed his entire lateral mass of C1 and C2, and we put a large allograft in which is here, and we fused him to the occipital, occipital, across the occipital junction, and here he is. Thoracic spine, accuracy. I'm not gonna tell anybody about accuracy because those are papers that they're plentiful. We've written plenty of them. We did thoracic uh, decompression and fusion surgery for tumors and degenerative cases back in the late 90s. Um, this is actually another case of a large, Jens was talking about a thoracolumbar um, a calcified disc case that I did just recently and used navigation to do this is that these, these are pretty essential cases that we use navigation for. Um, navigation for um, uh, deformity, we use different uh, reference frames, which I'm going to go over in the laboratory, but these are some of the uh, what we call uh, J clamps that we actually use, and we would bend a, we would bend a pedicle, um, excuse me, a uh, a rod and hook it to a pedicle screw. So when somebody has a previous operation, we actually have custom made ones now that are made by most of the manufacturers now. Um, so we're able to navigate uh, these kind of cases. Uh, percutaneous fixation, we do these with, uh, sometimes we will use percutaneous pelvic pins. I prefer not to, sometimes I'll just make a spinous process clamp exposure and that's probably easier to do. And then we do this with MIS, we will, do posterior fusions with uh, uh, small incisions that are inch, inch and a half in the, in the lumbar spine. Uh, these are done with K-wires. Uh, we have gone to doing a lot of guide wireless technology nowadays uh, as well. And so to be able to line the rods up uh, using some of the image guidance technology allows us to place the screws in a perfect cadence of which, which we're able to put in uh, the rods with ease. Um, what about difficult cases where uh, there's been no anatomy and you can't see anything? This is where the image guidance technology works incredibly well. You're doing revision surgery, PJK failure cases. Uh, you can do, do custom trajectories uh, anywhere you want. The pedicle is, uh, is simply your playground that you can use different navigations. So when you have patients like this, uh, you can create the reconstruction that you need. Spinal deformity, I'm going through these rapidly because I want to get to the end of my talk. 
is that uh, there's been a lot published about accuracy. We did some work with Dave Polly um, along with some of these as well. And uh, I think the literature is quite full of these kind of cases, which uh, um, high performance, difficult cases, narrow pedicles, pedicles and uh, pelvic fixation is a big part of that as well. Um, these are some case studies of uh, uh, the longevity of how these will hold up. Uh, they certainly do well in the short term and the accuracy we've, we've beat to death before. Um, I'm gonna keep going. Actually, I think I somehow came up with the old version of this talk. But I'll keep going. So going back to this concept about integration in the operating room. We used to use just a radiology tech and a scrub tech. That's all we did, and then we put screws in. And that's, Jens, that's still the way you do a lot of this, right, Jens? Okay. You're a good surgeon like Jens, and you don't have to have all this stuff. You don't need to have a nav navigation tech. The anesthesiologist is a part of it, no matter what. And the scrub tech, the implant tech, the RN, all these people, and then you've got the different pieces of equipment that come in and out of the room and they go like this and, and this is what I say is integration and this is what slows people down and this is what uh, we need to be able to do it because if we're gonna go on and do robotics, which we've heard about and we've seen about, okay, but this is just maybe another trip back down thoracic disc surgery, okay? We're now using, using all of this technology and we actually have taken it to the next level again. And I call this generation 2.5 is where we put the patients on a Jackson table. We're using a robot to hold the endoscope. So, so Dr. Theodore uh, and his uh, successors in training don't have to hold the endoscope and we still do these operations with quite a bit of frequency. So it's time for third generation, but you know what? The operating room doesn't look like this, okay? Operating room is a pretty messy place. I keep playing this slide or this this video over and over because it's a messy it's a messy place. What does integration mean? Okay, it's the action or process of integrating economic and political integration, combination, amalgamation, incorporation, unification, consolidation, merger, fusing, blending, meshing, homogenization. All these words are what integration is all about. So, what does it mean in the operating room? Okay, it's to functionally connect the surgeon to all of these devices and potentially with a single touch screen. But you know what, the surgeon doesn't necessarily want that either. They want a lot of that stuff managed by other people. So you depend on other people. You depend on all those people that are in the operating room. And the primary driver of this, this integrated technology is the minimally invasive stuff. We've heard about all these small incisions, but you know, some of us, we still do maximally invasive surgery, so it's applicable to open or closed surgery. It really is. But the minimally invasive work, the image guidance work, the robotics, telesurgery, all these things, they're going to replace traditional surgical procedures to a large degree, okay? Revision deformity surgery, it's still gonna get done open. Uh, what's the reality of what's happening in the operating room? Today, all of our operating rooms, they're inefficient, they're overcrowded, the turnover, okay, because of all this equipment. All this equipment is needing to be managed, okay, and then that comes down to the human factors. Okay, who manages it? That equipment just sits there and it's collecting dust or it's in the way or given problems. These new technologies, when they're introduced and they start disrupting your flow, okay, and we have some people that are working with us to look at flow, and they call these things flow disruptions, okay? Because if you stop and you lose five minutes between putting each pedicle screw in because of something, you got a bad problem, okay? Because if you're gonna go in and put in 24 or 28 pedicle screws in somebody, and sometimes they take you one minute between screws, and sometimes they take you 10 minutes, okay? And, and then you gotta do more CT scans, okay? Because all of this stuff has to be integrated along with teamwork of the people, communicate, coordinate, all of these things to improve the efficiency, the safety, and reduce the costs too. Because you don't want to end up with something that looks like this, okay? Fortunately, this patient didn't turn a hair. The surgeon who put him in is one of my partners, and 
I haven't had one like this, but anyway, they went into Kamban's triangle at every level. So there was a phase shift problem. This is a whole lecture that I can give about errors in navigation, so I, just one slide. So anyway, there, there's a lot that's been published in the, uh, the uh, endoscopic world, laparoendoscopic journals, I mean, trends of evolving technologies in the operating room of the future, cool stuff. I mean, this is actually a paper I looked at and I said, this is one of my old residents who published and is talking about integrated care with all of this stuff. And he's a pretty talented guy. Works down in Orange County and runs a big, huge practice. He's very successful. But all of this stuff with human factors, okay? Here's a guy we work with, Ken Catchpole. He came and lectured here uh, a couple times in the past few years, in fact, He's in one of these papers right here, I think highlights from the first annual navigation meeting that, uh, that most of the, most of the uh, speakers in the room here are on this, on this paper that we published. But anyway, here's one, here's one that's kind of entertaining because here's how it's supposed to work. Reducing operating room turnover time. Turnover, there's another factor. There's a human integration and human factors to turnover time, comparing it to motor racing pit stop. All right. Let's see if I can make the video work. This one's entertaining. I'm not sure where my volume is. Okay, so this is 2014. Here's 2013. Sorry, I'm not getting the volume here. The volume was wonderful. Here's 2013, they're pretty darn fast. Okay, here's 2010, just watch. Doubled the time. Still not gone, right? What the, what the heck is going on there? Okay, now I'm not gonna go too far with this. Here's 2007, 10 years ago, 12 years ago. I think I'll just show one more, but, but it's interesting to see just in 10 years time what happens in the pit stop, okay? And actually some of our human factors guys that, are, that we've been working with have written a paper about looking at this. And look at them in here, it's like, oh my God, they're working in slow motion, it seems like compared to 2014. So it may take us that many years to really get this stuff to work. Okay, you heard about robotics from Nick Theodore today. It doesn't look this pretty in the operating room though. You bring one more machine in there, okay? You bring one more big machine, okay? And you can drag it in and out of the, of the operating room like Nick says, which believe me, I'm a believer in it and I'm gonna do it and you know what, I'm on board with this and I'm doing it. But it's not this pretty, okay? Hopefully, robotics become less cumbersome, smaller, more compact and everything else that we do in the operating room. Okay, those big intraoperative CT scanners, why can't we make a small CT scanner that you bring in there, okay, that is a third the size? Or just make it half to begin with, okay? Start miniaturizing this stuff, start making it fast, start making it where we're not having to go outside and you know, have two cups of coffee and smoke a cigarette, you know, or whatever you do to get those things done. This is what our operating rooms look like today. Um, but you know what, a lot of institutions are actually building laboratories that will simulate what's happening in the operating room. We do this at Cedars, they have one for their trauma team, they go in and they practice procedures for, for trauma patients coming in. So remember we all did that when we were residents, how do you practice that? Okay, bring them in and everybody starts yelling at each other, do this, do that, and somebody's hopefully in charge. But. That was, our op that was our operating room laboratory, as we did it, or the, the ER was. You know, but we have new prototypes and we can design our operating rooms to make them work. Here's a multidisciplinary hybrid operating room. It's got every one of these things in here. You can bring to bear with speed, efficiency, and usefulness, and do the job that they're supposed to do and have the people that can do it, okay? The people are maybe the biggest challenge. 
I mean, these are just even prettier pictures, a futuristic hybrid operating room. Here's a digital operating room, looks like a nuclear submarine. How about that, isn't that cool? Okay, just because I'm not really from LA, but I have a day job there. This was, this was, this was two days ago in Artificial Intelligence and Aesthetics of Total Transformation about robots are now being used to cure and treat cosmetic issues and also maybe robotics are going to meet the demands of removing tattoos, okay? Because there is a greater demand for tattoo removal than there are people to remove them. So there's robotic technology. So I just thought that'd be a little interest. So anyway, we need to be able to adapt, you know, these complex everyday cases we do and use the equipment. We, get, we have to get the people and it's the human factors that are the biggest part of it. And it's, it's one of the things that I uh, hope I'll come back next year and tell you more about it. But these are some of the things that are really exciting and interesting. So. Um, there are more navigation meetings coming up. We just finished the Global Spine. There's NAS coming up. There's the uh, Seattle Science Foundation meeting this November, which I think is the best image guidance course in the world. Uh, and then um, the uh, Spine section meeting is in March. So I have to make a pitch for those. Thank you very much. Wow. So we'll want to switch to the lab because Dr. Bess is on standby. Allow me to summarize one question. If you look at this uh, kind of a picture or these last pictures of your ORs with multiple uh, gadgets and tools in there, do we need a new uh, kind of a job category? Do we need a systems tech officer for the operating room? Because uh, I mean, there's so many things that are so subspecialized. And for instance, Nick's uh, robot, where he troubleshot this so beautifully when his robot didn't quite work, there's a lot of expertise behind that in terms of how to troubleshoot. So do we need a systems tech officer for the OR who is in every complex spine case? I, I believe we do, and uh, I, I think it's a great question because I hadn't thought about having somebody from that high a level, but we, um, we already do in our, our shop, our hospital in Cedars, is that we have an image guidance tech crew. They manage the microscopes, the image guidance, the navigation, the robotics, they manage everything. Now, do we have somebody who is a lead engineer doing all that? We actually got some guy who's kind of a seat of the pants guy who does all that. So the answer is yes. Um, just to make all of the existing things that you have in your operating room work right now, I'll bet you you would benefit from having somebody like that. So uh, one more question, and then we'll switch to the lab. Um, what do we do if it fails? So this is a classic example of a complex system. I think we can all agree on that. And we saw it in Nick's uh, lab when the computer didn't, or the robot didn't quite respond, and a tightly coupled um, system. So that's something that's set up to fail at some point in time because of the intricate uh, uh, interwovenness and the lack of tolerances. If this just shuts down, if Nick's robot hadn't uh, put up again, you don't have your C-arm available or so, you don't have a redundant fail fallback system. Do we actually close the patient and take them out, or what do you suggest doing then if you don't have a real backup plan? Well, Jens, I love your enthusiasm when you said when it fails. <laughs> it's a matter of time. <laughs> and yes, I, I agree with that. I think the more we use it, the, the less bugs there are with anything. Okay, it, it happened with fluoroscopy. Okay, we used to put in hardware into people, and orthopedic surgeons used to put in joints into people. Okay, now they're all using image guidance. They're all using technology like this. The surgeons need to be trained, obviously, to be able to do these without this technology. They have to know how to do it. And that's actually incumbent upon us as the people who are training the, the surgeons of the next generation who are gonna be better at this stuff than we are. But they have to know how to do these operations without that technology. And that, that's what I preach every day. Show me where the entry point is. Show me what you're gonna do. Show me how you're going to do it, and I want to know every step of the way. Now you get to use the image guidance. Nick. I, I got a, I got a microphone here. That, that was a beautiful talk, Patrick. And I think, I think the other interesting point is this. I had a dinner with Michael Wadden, who's chairman at the Barron Neurologic Institute, a foremost brain surgeon. And I asked him, I said, if you're doing a brain stem cavernous tumor in the middle of the brain stem and your image guidance shuts down, are you going to just do the operation? Are you going to cut the person's brainstem open and do it? And he goes, well, of course not. 
we'd abort the operation. At some point, it would, you know, in, in the cases that Pat showed, that I would argue would be very difficult, if not impossible, to do without the technology, we, you're going to probably have to say you're not going to do it. But the counter argument is the more you use it and the better we get and more facile we get, the better the software gets, I think the less likely that's happening. But I think the reality is we're getting to that point where you're going to be reliant on that technology and you know, knowing how to do it the old fashioned way isn't going to be acceptable. Uh, just well, I, I think there are certain cases that probably, and I mean, it's one of those top one or two percent, and you cited one of them, somebody with a lesion inside of their brain stem. If you don't have an image guidance system that's working, you need to have a backup. Okay, that's another issue. You need to have one outside the room that you can wheel it in and make it work. Okay, everything has, you got, you got two C arms, I'm sure, that are sitting outside every operating room. So it, there is a redundancy that does need to happen to answer that kind of call and that kind of problem. Um, you know, lots of great questions, but you're right, is that the young surgeons need to know how to do these things, and I don't expect that top one or two percent. Hey, that's closing, going that way, that's just reality. As we're closing this lecture, one more uh, question. Uh, I was asked a question from a uh, fellowship applicant the other day that I thought I'd never hear. That fellowship applicant wanted to know whether we still put in screws without image guidance because they're worried that they would not learn how to put in hardware uh, by conventional means. So just food for thought. He came to the right place to work with you, Jens. A, a dinosaur. <laughs> I just got, a, I, I just got a, a dinosaur retirement article sent by Dr. Skaggs. So I feel very outdated. Thank you, Dave, for Thank that you. timely uh, sending. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Jens. Great talk. Pleasure to be here.